A note from Dr. Watson. My friend Sherlock Holmes was one of the cleverest and most important detectives in England some years ago. The police often asked him to help them. My name is Dr. Watson, and I helped Holmes with many of his cases. I kept careful notes and wrote about them. In 1891, Holmes and I had to leave England on a very dangerous case. While we were away, Holmes disappeared. Everyone thought that he was dead. I was very sad at the news. Then, one day in 1894, Holmes returned to England. He was not dead. At first, this was a secret, because he was working on another case. But when the case was finished, we were able to work together again. Holmes was now a better detective than ever before. This little book is called The Return of Sherlock Holmes. The stories come from my notes of the cases that we worked on after his return. Three of the best cases are here. The Six Napoleons, the Norwood Builder, and the Golden Glasses. I hope you will enjoy reading them. The Six Napoleons Mr. Lestrade, a detective from Scotland Yard, often visited my friend Sherlock Holmes and me in the evening. Holmes enjoyed talking to Lestrade because he learned useful facts about Scotland Yard, London's most important police station. Lestrade liked these visits, too, because Holmes was a good detective. Holmes always listened carefully if Lestrade had a difficult case. He often helped Lestrade. On one of these evening visits, Lestrade talked about the weather and other uninteresting things for a long time. Then he stopped talking and sat quietly. Holmes was interested in his silence. "'Have you got a good case for me today?' he asked. "'Oh, nothing important, Mr. Holmes,' said the detective. Holmes laughed. "'Please, tell me about it,' he said. "'Well, Mr. Holmes, there is something, but it doesn't seem very important.' I don't want to trouble you with it. I know you like difficult problems, but I think that this will perhaps interest Dr. Watson more than you. I was surprised when Lestrade said this. I like helping Sherlock Holmes with his detective work, but I am really a doctor, not a detective. So I said, What's the matter? Is somebody ill? Yes, I think so. I think that somebody is very ill, was Lestrade's answer. I think that he is completely mad. Someone is stealing cheap busts of Napoleon Bonaparte and breaking them. I think he hates Napoleon. Four days ago... He went into a shop in Kennington Road. The owner's name is Morse Hudson, and he sells pictures and other works of art. When the shop assistant was busy, the madman ran in. He picked up a bust of Napoleon, broke it into pieces, and then ran away. Nobody saw his face. Why are you so interested in this? said Holmes. Because he's done it again, replied Lestrade. Yesterday he got into the house of a doctor, Dr. Barnicott. This doctor is very interested in Napoleon. He lives near Morse Hudson's shop, and he bought two busts there. 
He kept one bust at home and the other in his office, two miles away. The thief took the bust from his home and broke it against the garden wall. Dr. Barnicott found it when he got up in the morning. He then went to his office at about twelve o'clock. To his surprise, the second bust was broken too. The pieces were all over the room. This is more interesting, said Holmes. Now, please tell me, were these three busts exactly the same? Yes, they were. Well, said Holmes, why did the man choose these three busts? I'm sure that there are hundreds of other busts in London. I think the thief was only interested in the busts, not in Napoleon. That's possible, Lestrade replied. But can we be sure? There is no other shop that sells busts in that part of London. Perhaps the madman lives in that area and began with the nearest busts. What do you think, Dr. Watson? Can someone hate Napoleon so much? Yes, it's possible, I said, and I told them some interesting examples from the history of medicine. But, I said, how did this madman know where these three busts were? It's very interesting, said Sherlock Holmes. Please tell us, Mr. Lestrade, if you learn more. Next morning, I was dressing when Holmes came into my room. Lestrade wants to see us immediately, he said. He's at a house in Kensington. I quickly finished dressing. We had a cup of coffee, then we went to Kensington. The house was in a quiet street, but it was not far from the busy centre of London. That morning there was a large crowd of people standing outside. Lestrade was waiting for us. He was looking very serious. I noticed that there was a lot of blood outside the front door of the house. Lestrade told us to come inside. There we met Horace Harker, the man who lived there. He worked for a newspaper, and today he had a good story, but he could not write about it. He was too frightened. Please tell us what you know, Mr. Harker, said Lestrade. I was woken by a loud cry at about three o'clock this morning, he said. I was very frightened, but I went downstairs. There was nobody in the room, but the window was open, and my bust of Napoleon was not there. So I opened the front door to call a policeman. I found a dead man lying there. He was covered in blood. I felt very sick. Who is the dead man? asked Holmes. We don't know, Lestrade answered. He had a cheap street map of London and a photograph of a very ugly man in his pockets. There was a small knife near him, but I don't know if he was killed with that knife. What about the bust of Napoleon? asked Holmes. We found it quite near here, in the garden of an empty house, said Lestrade. It was broken like the others. Lestrade took us to look at the broken bust. Mr. Harker stayed at home. He was beginning to feel better, and he wanted to write the story for his newspaper.
we soon arrived at the empty house. The pieces of the bust were lying in the grass by the garden wall. Holmes picked up some pieces and looked at them carefully. What do you think? said Lestrade. Holmes looked at him. There's a lot more work for us to do, he said, but there are some interesting questions here that we must think about. For example, why did a man kill someone for a cheap bust like this? And if he only wanted to break the bust, why didn't he break it at Mr. Harker's house? Why did he take it away with him? Maybe he carried it away because he didn't want Mr. Harker to hear him, said Lestrade. Perhaps that's the reason, said Holmes. But why did he bring it to this house and not another one? Because this house was empty, replied Lestrade. But there's another empty house in this road, nearer to Mr. Harker's house. Why didn't he break it there? I really don't know, replied Lestrade. Holmes pointed to the street light above our heads. He could see what he was doing here. The garden of the other house was too dark. That's true, said the detective. Then he asked, But how does this help us, Mr. Holmes? I don't know yet, my friend answered, but I'm going to think about it. What are you going to do next, Mr. Lestrade? I want to find out who the dead man was. I need to know why he was in Kensington last night. Then I'll know who killed him outside Mr. Harker's house. Isn't that a good idea? Perhaps, replied Sherlock Holmes, but it isn't my way. So, what are you going to do? asked Lestrade. I'll do things in my way, and you can do things in your way said Sherlock Holmes. Then we can talk about the case together later. Then he added something surprising. If you see Mr. Harker, please tell him this. I'm sure that a dangerous, Napoleon-hating madman was in his house last night. Lestrade was surprised. Do you really think that's true? Holmes laughed. Not really, he said, but I think the readers of Mr. Harker's newspaper will be interested. We must go now, but please visit us in our rooms in Baker Street at six o'clock this evening. Until then, can I keep the photograph that the dead man had with him? After you come to Baker Street, you must come out somewhere with me. Goodbye, and good luck. Mr. Harker's bust was from Harding Brothers' shop in the High Street, so Sherlock Holmes and I walked there together. Mr. Harding was not there. Holmes was not pleased by this. We'll come back in the afternoon, he said to Mr. Harding's assistant. And now, Watson, let's visit Mr. Morse Hudson's shop. Dr. Barnicott bought his busts there. Morse Hudson was very angry about the broken busts, but he answered all Holmes's questions. The busts were made by Gelder and Company in another part of London, he told us. I can't give you more help than that. But when Holmes showed him the photograph from the dead man's pocket, he cried, That's Beppo! Who's Beppo? asked Holmes. He's an Italian. He worked in my shop for a time. 
a useful man, but he left last week. I don't know where he went. He left two days before the bust was broken. We thanked Morse Hudson and left his shop. Holmes was quite pleased with what the shopkeeper told us. He decided next to visit Gelder and Company, the factory where the busts were made. We passed through many parts of London, rich places and poor places, before we came to Stepney. Stepney was a rich place in the past, but now poor working people lived there. Many of them came from other countries. We soon found Gelder and Company. We spoke to a German. In the past, we made hundreds of busts, he told us. But this year, we only made six. Three were sold to Morse Hudson, and three to Harding. The busts were cheaply made, usually by Italian workers. When Holmes showed him the photograph of the ugly Italian, he became angry. That's a very bad man, he said. His name is Beppo, and he worked here for me. But that was more than a year ago. Why did he leave? Holmes asked. He tried to kill another Italian with a knife. In the street, replied the German. The police followed him here and caught him. The other Italian didn't die, so Beppo was only sent to prison for a year. One of his friends works here now. Do you want to speak to him? No, no, said Holmes. Please, don't tell him anything. This is very important. All right, the man said. I have one more question, said Holmes. It says here, in your book, that you sold the busts on the 3rd of June last year. When did the police come for Beppo? Can you remember? Yes, I can. I paid Beppo for the last time on the 20th of May last year, and it was very soon after that. You've helped me a lot, said Holmes. I must go now. Remember, don't say anything to Beppo's friend. It was late in the afternoon, and we were hungry, so we stopped to have some food in a restaurant. Holmes bought a newspaper. In it was an exciting story by Mr. Harker about the madman who hated Napoleon. Most of the story was not true, but Holmes laughed a lot. He thought it was a good joke. This is very helpful, Watson, he said. I did not really understand what he meant, but I laughed too at the silly story. After our meal, we went to Harding Brothers. Mr. Harding was a busy little man, and he answered our questions quickly and clearly. His three busts were all sold, one to Mr. Harker of Kensington, one to a Mr. Josiah Brown of Chiswick, and the third to a Mr. Sandiford. Mr. Sandiford lived outside London, in Reading. Holmes seemed very interested in these facts, and thanked Mr. Harding. It was late, so we hurried back to Baker Street. We had to meet Lestrade. Lestrade was waiting for us when we arrived. He was very pleased with himself. Have you found out anything, Mr. Holmes? he asked. Well, we know a lot about the busts now, replied Holmes. The busts, said Lestrade.
and laughed. I know you're a clever detective, Mr. Holmes, but I think I've found out something more important than that. What have you discovered? I now know who the dead man was, and I think I've found the motive for his murder, was Lestrade's reply. Very good, Mr. Lestrade. Holmes smiled and waited. Lestrade continued. We have a detective at Scotland Yard who knows many of the Italians in London. He knew this man well. His name was Pietro Venucci, a thief and a very dangerous man. Venucci worked for the Mafia. He punished people who broke the rules of the Mafia. That was his job. Usually he killed them. I think the man in the photograph broke the rules. Venucci was following him. They had a fight, and Venucci was killed. Holmes smiled and said, Very good, Mr. Lestrade. Very good. But I still don't understand why the busts were broken. Lestrade almost shouted at Holmes, Those busts aren't important. Can't you forget them, Mr. Holmes? A man will only go to prison for six months for breaking busts. Pietro Venucci is dead. That's what interests me. I see, said Holmes quietly. What are you going to do next, Mr. Lestrade? I'm going to go to the area of London where the Italians live. I want to find the man in the photograph. Do you want to come with me? Holmes did not seem very interested. No, thank you. I think that we can find him more easily in another place tonight. Really? Where? At an address in Chiswick. If you come with me tonight, I will go with you tomorrow, said Holmes. Lestrade was surprised, but he agreed. The three of us had an early dinner together. Then Holmes told Lestrade and me to rest until eleven o'clock. Holmes did not rest. He spent the time in his room looking at some old newspapers. He was, I thought, probably looking for some facts about Venucci or Beppo. Lestrade and I woke up at half-past ten. Holmes was waiting for us. He told me to bring my gun. I noticed that he took his favourite strong walking stick with him. We quickly drove to Chiswick, and Holmes took us to a large house in a dark street. The house, too, was dark and quiet. The people inside were probably already asleep in bed. I'm glad that it's not raining, said Holmes quietly. It's possible that we'll have to wait a long time. We mustn't smoke, and we must be very quiet. I hope we're going to discover something tonight. We only had to wait for five minutes. The garden gate suddenly opened and a man ran quickly down the garden path towards the house. We could not see his face. It was too dark, and he was moving too quickly. He disappeared into the darkness, and we waited in silence. Next, we heard the sound of a window opening very slowly. Then... We saw a small light inside the front room of the house. Let's go to the open window. Then we can catch him as he comes out, said Lestrade. But before we moved, the man came outside again. He was carrying something. He looked around him.
he saw that nobody was watching him. Then there was a sudden crash as he broke the thing against the wall. We ran forward. Holmes jumped on his back, and the man fell heavily to the ground. Lestrade and I quickly went to help Holmes. I had my gun ready. Soon the man was our prisoner. He looked up at us. His face was very ugly. We could see that he was surprised and angry. I realized immediately that he was the man in the photograph. While we were holding the man on the ground, Holmes was looking at the broken pieces of another bust of Napoleon. He lifted up each piece and looked at it in the light. Somebody turned on the lights in the house. Then a short, fat man in a shirt and trousers came out towards Holmes. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes, aren't you? he asked with a smile on his face. That's correct, said Holmes. And you are Mr. Josiah Brown. Yes, sir. We did what you told us. We locked the doors to the house and turned off the lights. Then we waited very quietly. You've done very well. Please, come inside and have some food and drink. Holmes thanked Mr. Brown, but Lestrade wanted to take the man away, so we all drove to Scotland Yard. The thief said nothing, but he looked at us all the time. His ugly white face was like an animal's. When we arrived at Scotland Yard, the man was searched. He had nothing with him except a long knife with dry blood on it and a little money. As we were leaving, Lestrade said, Well, Mr. Holmes, I must thank you for all your help. My ideas were correct. Don't you agree? Holmes smiled and said, It's a little late at night now for me to explain, but I think the business of the busts is very important. It's much more important than you think. Can you come and see me again at six o'clock tomorrow evening? Of course, said Lestrade. I'm always happy to visit you. I'll be pleased to come. As we were going home, Holmes said to me, Lestrade is a good detective, but he doesn't understand everything about this case. I think this is a very unusual case, Watson. Really? I said. Is there more to explain? The busts, Watson. I think they're the most important part of this case. At six o'clock the next evening, Lestrade came to Baker Street to see us. He now knew more about Beppo. The Italian was a well-known thief. He spent time in prison after he knifed a man. We already knew that. Beppo was, Lestrade said, very good at making busts and other works of art. It was possible that Beppo made the busts of Napoleon at Gelder and Company. Holmes listened to Lestrade's words with a smile on his face, but I could see that he really wanted to tell Lestrade something. I was sure that it was something very surprising. There was a knock on the door, and the servant brought an old man into the room. He had a red face and he was carrying a large bag. He put the bag on the table. Is Mr. Sherlock Holmes here? he asked. Holmes smiled and said, I'm Sherlock Holmes, and I think that you're Mr. Sanderford of Reading. I'm pleased to meet you. This is my friend, Dr. Watson, 
And this is Mr. Lestrade from Scotland Yard. We both said hello to Mr. Sandiford. I have the bust of Napoleon for you, he told Holmes. He also had a letter. Mr. Holmes sent me this letter yesterday, he said to Lestrade and me. He read it to us. Dear Mr. Sandiford, I know from Mr. Harding that you bought the last bust of Napoleon in his shop. I want that bust very much, and I will pay ten pounds for it. Please bring it to my rooms in Baker Street, London, tomorrow at half past six. Sherlock Holmes. Then he said to Holmes, Do you know how much I paid for the bust in this bag? No, I don't, said Holmes. Well, I'm not a thief, Mr. Holmes. You should know that I only paid one pound for it. If you don't want to buy it now, I'll understand. No, said Holmes. I still want the bust. Here's ten pounds. He gave the money to Mr. Sandiford. Thank you very much, said Mr. Sandiford. He took the money and opened the bag. Inside was an ordinary white bust of Napoleon, just like the others. Holmes said, Thank you, Mr. Sanderford. Now, before you go, I want you to sign this piece of paper. It says that you sold the bust to me for ten pounds. Oh, of course, said Mr. Sanderford. He signed the note and left. Holmes watched Mr. Sandiford leave. Then he took a clean white cloth from a cupboard and put it on the table. The Strad and I watched him carefully. He put the bust carefully on the cloth. Then he took his stick and hit the bust hard. It broke into small pieces. Holmes shouted with excitement and picked up something small and black from the cloth. Lestrade and I were silent. This is the black pearl of the Borgias, said Holmes. We were both very surprised. Really, Holmes? I cried. How did you know that it was there? It's impossible said Lestrade quietly. Holmes explained. This is the most famous pearl in the world. It was stolen from the hotel room of the Princess of Colonna on the 22nd of May last year. I'm sure that you remember that, Mr. Lestrade. Yes, I do, replied Lestrade. Well, Holmes continued, you will also remember where the hotel was. The princess was staying in the same part of London as Gelder and Company. The police thought that the thief was an Italian servant in the hotel, Lucretia Venucci, but they never proved it. I think that her brother, Pietro, was killed two nights ago. When I looked at my old newspapers, I discovered something. Beppo was caught only two days after the pearl was stolen. The busts were made in those two days. Perhaps the Venucci stole the pearl from the hotel, and Beppo stole it from them. I don't know exactly, but it doesn't matter. I am sure now that Beppo had the pearl with him on the night of his street fight. He ran away, and the police followed him. Beppo ran to Gelder's and wanted to hide the pearl. But where? He didn't have much time. He saw the new white busts of Napoleon drying on the table. They were still soft, and 
so he pushed the pearl into one of them. Then he covered the hole. It was the perfect place to hide the pearl. Because of the street fight, Beppo was sent to prison for a year. During that time, the six busts were sold. But we know that Beppo's friend still worked at Gelder's. I think that Beppo asked him to find the names of the buyers of the busts. So when Beppo came out of prison, he started looking for the bust with the pearl in it. He got a job with Morse Hudson. There he learned where the first three busts were. Then he left the job, returned and broke the first bust. Next, he broke Dr. Barnicott's busts. But he didn't find what he was looking for. The other three busts were sold to Mr. Harding's shop. Beppo found out who had them. I'm not sure how he did that. Perhaps an Italian friend was working there. At the same time, Venucci knew that Beppo was out of prison. He wanted to find him. He was sure that Beppo knew the Pearl's hiding place. Venucci was following Beppo when he went to Mr. Harker's house in Kensington. They fought, and Beppo killed Venucci. But, I asked, if Venucci knew Beppo well, why did he carry his photograph? To show to other people, replied Holmes. Of course, he continued, I wasn't sure that Beppo didn't find the pearl in Mr. Harker's bust. But if he didn't, there were only two more busts. One was in Chiswick, and the other one was in Reading. Chiswick is much nearer than Reading, so I told Josiah Brown and his family to be ready. We were lucky. Beppo went to Mr. Brown's house first, and we caught him. I knew then that the pearl was in Mr. Sandiford's bust. Mr. Harker's newspaper report helped us. His story made Beppo very happy. The police seemed to have the wrong idea. They were looking for a Napoleon-hating madman. He didn't think that anyone knew the true secret of the busts. But when I heard the name Venucci, I immediately thought of the missing black pearl. Mr. Holmes, said Lestrade, I've seen your work on many cases in the past, but this is one of the best. I'm sure that my friends at Scotland Yard will be very interested in the case. They will also be interested in the way that you solved it. Can you come and meet them tomorrow? They will be very pleased to talk to you. I shall be happy to come, said Holmes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes, said Lestrade. You've helped me to understand this case, and you found the famous Black Pearl for me. Holmes smiled at the police detective. He didn't know what to say. Then suddenly his face changed. Well, Watson, he said, we have to do some work now. This is not our only case. Goodbye, Lestrade. If you have any more little cases for me, please tell me. I'll be happy to help you if I can. The Norwood Builder There seem to be no interesting cases these days, Watson, Sherlock Holmes said to me. London isn't a very interesting place. I don't think the people of London will agree with you, I answered. He smiled as he pushed his chair back from the breakfast table. You're right. I mustn't be selfish, he said.
It is better for everybody if detectives like me have little work. I smiled, too. The world did seem very quiet that morning. Sherlock Holmes sat back in his chair, picked up his newspaper, and started reading. Suddenly there was a loud knock on the front door. I heard the servant open the door. Then somebody ran into the house and up the stairs. He opened our door and stood in front of us. He looked very frightened. I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, he cried. I must talk to you now. I can't wait. I'm John Hector Macfarlane. I'm sure that you know my name. Sit down, Mr. Macfarlane, said Holmes. No, I don't know your name, but I can see that you're an unmarried lawyer. The man seemed surprised at this but it didn't surprise me. Holmes was a good detective, and even I noticed the man's untidy clothes and the lawyer's papers in his hand. That's true, Mr. Holmes, he replied, and it's also true that I'm the unhappiest man in London today. Please help me. The police are coming to get me. I'm sure that they followed me here. I'll go with them if you'll help me. The police are coming, said Holmes. He looked very happy. I knew that he was hoping for an interesting case. Then he remembered poor Mr. Macfarlane and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Macfarlane. This seems very interesting. Please tell me more. Why are the police looking for you? They think I killed a man. His name's Jonas Oldacre. The newspaper was still lying on the table, and our visitor picked it up. I noticed that his hands were shaking. Look at your newspaper, he said. You'll see why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes, he said. Look at this. Fire in Lower Norwood. Rich man disappears. Is he dead? Was he killed? I took the newspaper and looked at the report. The police, it said, wanted to find Mr. Macfarlane. They think I killed Mr. Oldacre for his money, said the poor man. What will my mother think? What can I do? I looked at Mr. Macfarlane carefully. He was a handsome man with fair hair, and he was probably about twenty-seven years old. His clothes showed that he had plenty of money. Then I looked at Sherlock Holmes. His eyes were closed, so I read him the newspaper report. Late last night, or early this morning, there was a fire in Sydenham Road in Lower Norwood. The police are worried about Mr. Jonas Oldacre, the owner of the house. Mr. Oldacre is well known in the area. He made a lot of money as a builder, but has stopped doing building work. He is sixty-two years old, unmarried, and lives at Deep Dean House. He has few friends. Mr. Oldacre still keeps a lot of old wood at the back of his house. When a fire started there last night, at about twelve o'clock, the wood burned fast. At first it seemed like an ordinary fire, but then someone noticed that the owner of the house was not there. In one room there were some important papers on the table and signs of a fight. A stick was found on the floor, and also some blood. Mr. Oldacre had a visitor last night, a lawyer called John Hector Macfarlane. The police think that the stick belongs to him. There are also signs that something heavy was pulled through the grass, from the house to the fire. Something 
an animal or a person was burned with the old wood. The police think that Mr. Oldacre was killed in his house. Then he was taken outside and burnt. They are looking for Mr. McFarlane. Mr. Lestrade of Scotland Yard is working on the case. When I finished reading, Sherlock Holmes opened his eyes. So why, Mr. McFarlane, haven't they found you yet? he asked. I live with my mother and father at Torrington Lodge in Blackheath, said Mr. McFarlane. But last night I wasn't at home. I stayed at a hotel in Norwood, because my visit to Mr. Oldacre finished very late. The police will try to catch me today. I think they'll come here for me. Suddenly there was another knock on the front door, and we heard policemen's voices. Two men waited outside, and one joined us upstairs. It was our friend, Lestrade, the detective from Scotland Yard. Lestrade looked straight at Macfarlane and said, John Hector Macfarlane, you must come with me. We believe that you killed Jonas Oldacre last night. Macfarlane stood up. His face was white. Sit down, said Holmes, and, Mr. Lestrade, please sit down too. But I must take Mr. Macfarlane away, said Lestrade. Half an hour won't matter to you, replied Holmes. And Mr. Macfarlane wants to tell us what happened last night. Well, Mr. Holmes, said Lestrade, because you're my good friend, I'll wait for half an hour, but no more. Thank you, said Holmes. Then he asked Mr. Macfarlane to tell us his story. Mr. Macfarlane began. Yesterday morning I knew nothing about Mr. Oldacre, except his name. He was a friend of my mother and father a long time ago, but not now. I was very surprised when he came to my office yesterday. I'm a lawyer. Mr. Oldacre showed me some papers, his will, which I have here. He asked me to make a good copy of the will. He wanted to wait, so I began the work. I soon saw, to my surprise, that he wanted to give me all his money after his death. I asked him why he wanted to do that. He explained he had no children, but he knew my father, so he wanted me to have the money. Of course, I thanked him for his great kindness, but I was still very surprised. I made the copy as quickly as possible. Finally, it was finished. He asked me to go to his house that evening to see some more important papers. His last words to me were, Please don't tell your mother and father. I want this to be a surprise for them. Mr. Oldacre was being very kind to me. I wanted to do exactly what he said. So I sent a message to my parents. I had important business after work, I said. I told them not to worry if I did not come home. Mr. Oldacre asked me to be at his house at nine o'clock, but I couldn't find it. I didn't arrive until half-past nine. Mr. Oldacre— Stop, said Holmes. Who opened the front door? An old woman. I think she worked for Mr. Oldacre. And did she know your name? Yes, replied the young lawyer. Then she took me into a room. There was a simple meal waiting for me on the table— I ate some of the food, and then Mr. Oldacre came and took me to another room. He had a lot of papers in a cupboard there, and we worked on these together for a long time.'
We didn't finish until about half past eleven. Mr. Oldacre told me to leave quietly by the back door, because the old woman was asleep. When I was leaving, I couldn't find my stick. But Mr. Oldacre said, That doesn't matter, my boy. You can get it another day. I hope you're going to visit me very often. When I left him, the cupboard was open. The papers were still on the table. I couldn't go back to Blackheath. It was too late. So I stayed at the Annerley Arms in Norwood. I didn't know about all this until I read the paper this morning. Mr. McFarlane stopped speaking, and Lestrade said, "'Have you any more questions, Mr. Holmes?' "'No. I want to go to Blackheath first, said Holmes. "'Don't you mean Norwood?' asked Lestrade. "'Perhaps I do,' replied Holmes, and he smiled at Lestrade. Holmes often understood things more quickly than Lestrade, and the police detective knew this. Lestrade turned to Mr. McFarlane and said, "'There are two policemen waiting for you outside. You must go with them now.' The policeman took Mr. McFarlane away. His face was still white, and he looked at us sadly, but he said nothing. Lestrade stayed in the room with us after McFarlane left. Holmes picked up the lawyer's papers and looked at them. Then he passed them to Lestrade. These are very interesting, aren't they? he said. Lestrade looked at the papers for a minute, then said, I can understand the first few lines perfectly. The writing is good. After that, the writing is very bad, and I can't read it. Later, there are some more good lines. Then the writing is bad again. Why do you think it's like that? asked Holmes. Why do you think it's like that? replied Lestrade. The answer is very simple, said Holmes. Mr. Oldacre wrote this on the train, on his way to London. The good parts were written at stations. The bad parts were written when the train was moving. The Strad laughed and said, Very good, Mr. Holmes, but how does that help us with the case? Well, said Holmes, most people don't write their wills on trains. It seems that this will wasn't really very important to Mr. Oldacre. It was very important, said Lestrade. His will is the reason that he's dead now. Do you think that's true? asked Holmes. Don't you? replied Lestrade. It's possible but the case isn't very clear to me yet. Not clear, said Lestrade. It's very clear to me. When Macfarlane knew about Mr. Oldacre's will, he went to Norwood. He killed Mr. Oldacre, and then he burned the dead body. It seems very simple to me. Too simple, said Holmes. Macfarlane is not stupid. A clever man doesn't kill a man on the same day that he made his will, and the man's servant knew that Macfarlane was in the house. Does a clever man carefully burn the body and then carelessly leave his stick in the house? You know very well, Mr. Holmes, said Lestrade, that a murderer doesn't always think very clearly just after his crime. It's easy to forget something like a stick. Perhaps he was afraid to go back into the house. What other motive is there for Mr. Oldacre's murder? I can think of many possible motives, said Holmes. Here's an example. A thief was passing the house and saw the two men in a room with the papers. 
he thought that they had money there. When one of the men left, the thief came in through the window. Then he killed the other man. Why didn't he take anything? asked Lestrade. Because he found only papers. There was no money in the room, said Holmes. Lestrade did not seem very sure of his ideas now, but he said, Well, you can look for your thief if you want to, Mr. Holmes, but I think that Macfarlane was Mr. Oldacre's killer. He had a motive. He was also the only person in the world who did not need to take anything from Mr. Oldacre's house. It was already his, in Mr. Oldacre's will. I didn't say that you were wrong, replied Sherlock Holmes. I only wanted to show you that there were other possible motives for Mr. Oldacre's death. And now, good-bye, Mr. Lestrade. I will probably see you at Norwood later today. The Strad left us, and Holmes put on his coat. I'm going to Blackheath, he said. Why not Norwood? I asked. Two strange things have happened, my friend, and the police are only thinking about one of them. The first thing was the strange will. Why did Oldacre want to give his money to Mr. Macfarlane? I'm going to find out. Do you want me to come with you? I asked. No, it isn't necessary. You can't help me. There's no danger at Blackheath, replied Holmes. <laughs>